In this video, I'm going to show you my vegetable garden and go through some secrets that you can use in your garden to grow better vegetables. I used to have my vegetables in my formal garden, but I find vegetable gardens are just not the neatest gardens. So I decided to move it out back here in the back of the property. And as you can see, it's pretty much surrounded by trees and shrubs and a lot of weeds. So in my garden, I have problems with the weeds, but I also have a lot of problems with animals. I have deer going through here and almost every other kind of rodent animal that you can think of wants to come and eat my garden. So one of the first things I did was built myself a fence. It's just a simple wood structure with chicken wire on the edge. The chicken wire is buried in the ground about six inches to keep things from digging underneath the fence. I found this works really well. I don't get a lot of small animals going into the garden to eat things. The big problem out here are deer. They would come and eat all this stuff. And if you look at this fence, it's really too short for deer. A recommended fence for deer is about eight feet tall. And I thought, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Is there a different way to keep deer out of your garden? And the secret is you can use a low fence provided the area inside the fence is kept small. Deer don't like jumping into an area that's too small for them. The width of this garden is about 16 feet. The length is much more than that. So to make those small compartments, I decided to put a couple dividers down the middle. That gives me an area that's too small for deer to bother with, but it also gives me something for my vegetables to climb up. So I maximize the space I have. This has worked really well for deer. When I started this garden, this was slope and I had to level it for the garden. Now you might wonder, well, why did I build it on a slope? This area is called rolling hills and everything is a hill. There's really no flat ground around here. So I didn't really have any other choices. As a result of this, the garden is sitting in kind of a valley and the hill goes up this way and it goes up this way behind the camera. And this does give me an advantage. I'm in zone five and it's fairly cool here. This small valley is enough to warm this area up more than at the top of these hills. These hills aren't very high, but this small amount of slope is enough to make this a warm spot, which means I can plant earlier in the spring and it stays warmer in the fall. I decided to make a small raised bed outside of my fenced area and grow my garlic here. Animals don't like garlic, so they leave it alone. I've never had anything come and bother the garlic, so it doesn't need to be inside the barrier. I can use this extra space here. Now I have a separate video that will show you how to grow garlic, but here's a little secret. I plant the garlic in the fall. I cover the ground with straw and that keeps the ground warm in the fall. This allows the bulbs to make roots and keep growing longer in the fall. Then in the spring, I come along and I move that straw off because now the soil is cold and I want the sun to come down and warm it up to get things growing. Once the garlic is three or four inches tall, I put the straw back again because now I don't need extra heat, but I do need to preserve the moisture in the soil. And so now the straw is keeping that soil nice and moist and constant. I almost never water this bed, although some water runs down if I water in there. I love growing strawberries and I decided to keep those outside my main garden area. I build a little bit of a raised bed here, mostly to keep the weeds out from the bed. The strawberries were growing really great that first year and I was looking forward to a great crop the second year. And then the deer came through here, walked all over it in the winter time, ate everything that they could. Then the rabbits came in and finished them off in the spring and pretty much decimated the whole thing. So I had to come up with some way to protect the strawberries. And you want to protect them both from the animals and from the birds who come down and damage the fruit. So I came up with this little idea. I covered the whole thing with a frame that has chicken wire on it. So that allows pollinators in, but keeps the birds out. But now how do I get in here? Well, this is split into two pieces, so I can just lift it up. Pick my strawberries, do my weeding, whatever needs to be done, and then put it back. And this has worked great. Now I have no critters in here, and the strawberries are doing fine. One of the things I really like in a vegetable garden is some permanent lattice system. Now you can get some poles and build some teepees, or you can use string to make a lattice system. It's really nice if you have a permanent structure. 
This is a wood frame with these metal pieces that I found. I just have this permanently here. It's ready to go every spring. I don't have to set it up. I don't have to play with it. I've been using it for about eight years now and it looks as good today as the day I got it. In the early spring, I grow peas on this side because I can plant those really early and they'll get harvested about the middle of summer. I'm in zone five here and so we have a fairly cold climate. The peas are now this high and I grow sugar snaps, so they'll be up to about here by the time I pick them. The tomato plants are on this side, and I just planted those about a week ago. Usually I have sweet 100s here, which is also a vine, and so that grows up this side. Now I don't have to tie things. Once I get the pea started, they cling by themselves. And the tomato plants, I just take the new growth and push them through the holes. I basically weave the tomato plants in and out of this lattice system. That makes it really easy to control the plants. And what's nice about this system is that I harvest peas while the tomatoes are growing. By the time the peas are finished, the plants are dying down, the tomatoes need the space, they get extra root room, plus they get some extra nitrogen, hopefully from the peas that have left it in the ground. Although the amount of that nitrogen from peas is pretty small, but even a little bit will help. I only grow indeterminate tomatoes because I want tomatoes over a longer harvest. I don't want a whole bunch at once. We can only eat a couple large tomatoes a day, so I don't need more than that, but I want a long growing season. So here I grow my other tomatoes and I'll just train them up these poles. By the end of the summer, they'll be about this height. You'll notice that outside my fenced area, we have nothing but wildflowers. Well, I prefer to call them weeds because once those flowers produce seed, it all blows into here and I would have a terrible time weeding this place. I'd have to do it on a weekly basis. That's way too much work for me. So what I do in a vegetable garden is I mulch with straw. I just put this down yesterday. I get several bales of straw, loosen it up, spread it around, push it around the plants. Once the straw covers the soil, you get almost no weeds. And where there are weeds growing, they're very easy to pull out because the straw keeps the moisture in the ground. So in my opinion, straw is an absolute necessity in a vegetable garden. It controls the weeds and it reduces the amount of watering you have to do. That's important for tomato plants. A lot of people are concerned about their tomatoes getting blossom end rot. So they go on the internet to find solutions. And there's thousands of solutions out there. Epsom salts, Tums, all kinds of calcium formulas. The problem is blossom end rot has nothing to do with calcium. Blossom end rot is caused by irregular watering. As long as moisture is kept in the ground at a steady amount, you won't get blossom end rot. That's why straw is so important. It keeps the moisture in the ground regular. Now I like to grow my root crops in rows. I've tried wide beds where you just spread the seed around and that does work, but I find weeding that is so much more difficult because you have to figure out where all the weeds are and you miss a lot of them. For me, the rows work very well, but I combine several gardening ideas. I like the idea of square foot gardening because it encourages people to plant things closer together. I don't like the rules of square foot gardening because you have so many plants in each square foot and that doesn't make any sense. But the idea from square foot gardening is that plants can grow closer together than the seed package says. And so I plant in rows, but I put them pretty close together. They're about a foot apart. That gives the plants enough root room to grow it gives me enough space so I can actually walk between the rows for weeding and it reduces the amount of surface area for weed. So there's less weeding to be done. And I find this system works quite well. Over here I have some lettuce and carrots planted in the same row. Carrots are a slow grower, so the lettuce will be harvested long before the carrots need the space. Over here I have radishes and beets, both in the same row. Again, radishes grow very quick. You harvest those. The beets are much slower growers, so you harvest them later. But you can plant the seeds at the same time. In fact, it's a good idea with things like carrots that germinate slowly because the lettuce comes up right away from seed and shows you where the row is, and the carrots come up much later. I do succession planting, and I start them as early as possible. So whatever people recommend, start a couple weeks earlier. Just do one row. 
If the weather gets really bad and kills that row, you haven't lost anything. But if you wait around till the weather's perfect, you've already lost a month. And in cold climates, that's a lot of vegetables. So put them in early, plant a couple rows, come back three weeks later, plant another couple rows, three weeks later, plant another couple rows. That gives you a continual harvest and you don't have to worry if the weather gets really bad. This is my row of cucumbers. A lot of people say that cucumbers don't like to be transplanted and that you should start with seeds in the garden. Well, that's simply not true. Now, they may not like to be transplanted, but it works just fine. So I start my cucumbers about a month early inside, get them conditioned for outside weather, and then plant them. And I do it kind of carefully, so I don't disturb the roots as I'm doing that. But I find that system works fine, and it gives me a head start on the season. The other myth about cucumbers is that you have to plant them in a hill. I've written about that in my book, Garden Myths, book two. The word hill used to mean a community. It didn't mean a mound of soil. So there's very little reason to grow on a mound of soil unless your garden is really wet and you wanna dry those seedlings up. So I grow cucumbers in a row. There's a plant here, two feet over, there's another plant and so on. That gives each plant more room to grow. They do better. I just grow them on flat ground. You don't need a hill. The cucumbers have been in the ground here for about a week. I've mulched them with straw to keep them good and moist, and they're starting to grow really well. I put them along here because I'm going to grow those cucumbers up this fence. And again, cucumbers take a lot of space in the garden, and if I let them sprawl, it would just take a huge area. You gotta go vertical with cucumbers. Now, four plants might not look like very much, but there's only two of us living in the house now, and this provides more cucumbers than we ever want. By August, I can't stand cucumbers. I get too many of them. This is my second set of trellis. I do this one a little different than the others. On the back side, I grow peas again. But what I usually do is the far trellis gets peas that are planted really early, and this gets peas that are planted a few weeks later. That way I can harvest peas over a longer period of time. And by the way, I only grow sugar snaps. Other types of peas produce a lot of green pods that you throw away, or they don't produce the peas. Sugar snaps, you eat the whole thing, and you get the most productivity out of your given space. On this side of the trellis, I grow beans. Peas are a cool crop, beans are a warm crop. So the peas will be a foot tall before I even plant my beans. And the peas will be harvested, before my beans start making pods. So it's great to grow these two crops together and they can use the same trellis system, saving me a lot of space. Now what I find here is that when I plant beans, they germinate quite well, but then something comes and eats them. And you'll see the little first leaf come out and something nibbles on it and then it makes another little leaf and something nibbles on it. And it seems to take forever for those beans to really grow into a decent sized plant. Now once they're a couple inches tall, whatever's eating them doesn't do enough damage to bother them. So a few years ago I started a different system. I now plant my beans and cover them with a row cover. I leave this on until the beans are a good size and they can take a bit of nibbling. So let's have a look and see what we ended up with here. I have a couple loops in here just to keep the real cover off the plants. It's probably not necessary. And the plants are looking really good. The leaves aren't perfect. There are some chew marks in them, but there's lots of leaves. They're growing nice. They're about eight inches tall. They're ready to start vining. And these plants will be great. Today's kind of cloudy, so it's a good day to take off the row cover and get them exposed to a little more light. These beans will be fine. By the time I'm harvesting them, I'll be reaching over my head. I only grow pole beans because they produce over a long period of time. Bush beans are great if you're going to can them, but all those beans are ready at once. And you pick them and then you're done. With these, I get beans about midsummer, and I'll have beans coming out of this garden until frost. So I harvest over a long period of time. There's about eight feet of trellis here for the beans. I plant the beans about two or three inches apart, and this row gives me more beans than I ever want. At least half the beans I give away. This amount of beans is enough to feed a family of four every second night. I'm also gonna mulch the beans with straw, 
And what I do with this is I actually push it up against the plants. It forces the vine closer to the trellis and they find their own way up. I hope you can use some of the ideas I presented in this video. If you want to know more information about growing any of those vegetables, I have a set of 10 videos that describes how to grow each of the most popular vegetables for beginners. You might wonder why I'm standing here and not in my vegetable garden, but I thought you'd enjoy seeing my abelia. French lilacs have just finished flowering. The Korean lilacs are just starting, but right now the star of my garden is this abelia covered with flowers. It's extremely fragrant and it's such a beautiful bush and very few people grow it. it. Has no bugs, no caterpillars, no diseases. I don't do anything to this shrub. It's been sitting here for 10 years. All I did this year was cut some of it back because it was getting too big. Anyways, back to vegetable gardening. I've given you some ideas and I hope you'll be able to use those. But we haven't really discussed the big secret of vegetable gardening, and that's the soil. If you don't have good soil, you're going to struggle with vegetables. So what's the secret to good soil? Well, there's several things I do. When I started my vegetable garden, I dug up the garden, put in a lot of horse manure, mixed it all up, and that was the first season. Since then, I don't do anything to the soil. I don't dig in it, except where I actually have to plant. When I'm planting a cucumber or tomato plant, I only dig a small hole big enough for that plant. I don't dig up the whole garden. When I'm planting seeds, I rake the top a little bit to level it out, and then I make a small ferrule, just big enough for the seeds. You want to dig in the soil as little as possible. Just leave it alone. The second part of creating good soil is to keep adding organic matter. Once in a while I do put in some compost, but my main organic source are the weeds that I pick up and leave in the garden. All the vegetable refuge at the end of the season just gets dropped in that garden. I don't take it away and compost it, I just leave it there. That's organic matter that the soil needs. But the most important part is that straw. That straw lasts about a year and a half and then it's decomposed. So I'm constantly adding organic matter to that soil and I let nature take it into the soil. I just leave the straw on top, the bottom layer slowly decomposes and rots. Worms and beetles and all kinds of insects take it into the soil, the bacteria turn it into good soil. You can't buy good soil. You have to make it and it takes time. Good soil is created when the bacteria and the organic matter get together and have a party. And they create something called soil aggregation. And when you have good aggregation, you end up with good soil and you can grow lots of vegetables. Now if you want to learn more about soil, have a look at my book, Soil Science for Gardeners. It'll explain everything you need to know about soil. It'll help you analyze your current soil situation and it'll help you develop a personalized soil development plan so that over a period of time, you will improve the soil in your garden. Have fun growing those vegetables.